So you know how these stories go, right? There's a shooting. Uh, it's terrible. We're all brokenhearted. A guy walks in, in this case, a guy walks into a high school, 17 people, I think, so far is the last number I heard. I'm not going to go through the whole thing because the stories are always the same. This was a kid that the FBI had been alerted about. He had been expelled. He was constantly bragging about his guns. He actually posted somewhere that I'm going to become a professional school shooter, slipped through the cracks, and he goes in and uh, and opens fire, and it's a nightmare. And I mean, it's, some of this stuff is caught on uh, on cell phones and videotapes, and you can watch them. What, what we always know is going to happen is immediately the media comes out with one th Before the facts are even known, the media always comes out. And this is not going to be a rant about the media. I'm not going to do that thing. But I, I do have to show this montage just to remind us this is the way that shootings get covered. This is uh, six. There's been a theme in many of his remarks after that church shooting in Texas. President Trump said it would be a little too soon to talk about gun laws after the massacre in Las Vegas. He said we'll be talking, quote, we will talk about gun laws as time goes on. David, there has not been a, a very serious public policy conversation about gun control here at this administration in this White House. The president. We will see if this is the one that forces that policy conversation. Uh, this, according to Bill Bratton, the former NYPD commissioner, is... Yet another example of how this country seems to have the sick preoccupation uh, with guns, and, and it manifests itself into these really terrible mass shootings. The country is not serious about understanding where we fall short of international standards. In this case, we are going to say we're an exceptional country. If you look at other peer countries in places like Japan or Western Europe, they do not have the incidence of violence against children that we have in this country. We I read a stat tonight. There have been 18 school shootings elsewhere in the world over the last two decades. In our country alone, there have been 18 school shootings in the last 35 days. And do you believe lawmakers failed you in that moment? Do you believe we can do better than this? Go a little bit bigger picture here for me. 18th school shooting this year. I, I keep saying that because it's only the middle of February. Right. We are the scourge of the world when it comes to these. Nobody is worse than we are. How does that not make the MAGA agenda? So it's all this stuff, you know, and of course, what happens is, is the facts come in frequently. It turns out there was a law on the books. The guy slipped through. Nothing that they do would have made any difference, uh, but they doesn't change anything. They never change their tune. That one guy that you saw, Philip Mudd, who's the counterterrorism expert on CNN, who was making a speech about how Tokyo and Europe are so much better uh, than we are about this. He, he had this moment when he just completely fell apart. Uh, play that clip. I have 10 nieces and nephews. We're talking about bump stocks. We're talking about legislation. A child of God is dead. Cannot we acknowledge in this country that we can't, we cannot accept this. I can't do it, Wolf. I'm sorry. We can't do it. Now, now normally I would make fun of this guy because this is CNN. CNN is uh, news people coming on and their lips tremble and their eyes fill. And that is supposed to take the place of some kind of conversation. Now, I'm not going to make fun of him because I, I'm not blaming him for crying. You know, this is I'm going to get a little abstract here because I actually don't want to sit around talking about the, the shooting, uh, which is always, again, always the same horrible, atrocious story uh, as the last one. But. It, you know, one of the reasons that um, that Plato didn't trust writing is he said you have to be able to look at a man to get the truth. You know, he writing was a new technology, and he basically said, you know, I, it's it's going to ruin our memories and it's going to dis, uh, dis separate us from the guy who talks. And the thing is, it's nothing wrong, obviously, with crying even on the air, cry, breaking down over these dead children. Who wouldn't? That's what tears are for. But the thing that you say and the way that you say it are two separate things that affect one another. I mean. A, uh, just a simple example, if I'm trying to explain to our producer, Rob, uh, that two plus two equals four and he just can't get it, I may lose my temper and say, damn it, two plus two equals four, right? And, you know, that two plus two, the, the words that are coming out of my mouth are literally true. The tone in which I'm saying them is suggesting that Rob is dense or that he's, there's something wrong with him. That's not true. That's So the, my emotions are untrue in that case. My words are literally quite, you know, bluntly true. That's all. If you just put that down on paper as writing you wouldn't see what had really happened there. And that was Plato's objection, basically, one of his objections. In this case, it's the other way around. The emotions are quite reasonable, completely reasonable, but that has nothing to do with the words that are coming out of his mouth about bump stocks. And we don't know if there were bump stocks used. We don't know anything about this or whether any of this would do anything. And that has become the way that 
issues are discussed. You know, one of my favorite books, in fact, the book, now that I think about it, is the book that that example, uh, a similar example about math, uh, speaking math in an angry voice comes from. Uh, one of my favorite uh, books is a book called After um, Virtue. It's by uh, Alice Dare McIntyre, and it talks about why, one of the things it talks about is, I'm just about to reread this book, so it's been a while since I've read it, but, I'm, but I do remember it because it really had a big, big effect on me. One of the things he talks about is why our conversations are so um, endless, why they are so endless, why they go on, why we keep having the same conversations over and over again, abortion, uh, justice, guns. It just keeps going on and it gets very frustrated. Uh, the, the reason, one of the reasons that this book, After Virtue, says that our arguments go on forever is because we ascribe to what is called emotivism, that are our, our, the way of talking about things, our way of talking about things has fallen apart. And emotivism is the idea that all judgments are nothing but an expression of preference. So if I say this is good, what I mean is I like this, I prefer it. This philosophy is nonsense, but we have sunk so deep into it that we basically think that's what we're arguing about. We're arguing about whether this guy cries on the air. We're arguing about whether you feel offended. We're not arguing about whether something is right or wrong. You know, and what, one of the things that I keep saying, in order to know whether something is right or wrong, you have to know what something is for. Yesterday on, uh, on Twitter, a band called uh, Our Last Night tweeted me and said, we, we saw you on Dave Rubin. And we're, we, the guy said he's a big fan of the show. He's listening to the show, but he happened to see me on do an interview on Dave Rubin. And he wrote a song for me, uh, inspired by me. And it kind of cracked me up because it's this kind of punk, uh, is that what, is, what would be called, punk rock? Yeah, that I wouldn't listen to. But the lyrics of the opening come right out of my mouth. So it's very, play this thing and you can hear hear me talking in it. It's not, you know, it's pretty good, actually. It's, good, it's a good song, and apparently they're a big cover band, and people really like them. Uh, and the video is very cool. It's got a, it gets very weird as it goes on. It's got, like, this half-formed body on, the, uh, on a table and all this. But the stuff that I'm, say, that I'm saying through that song, uh, that you have to know what you're for in order for your philosophy to make sense and in order to know the good from the bad, you know, I mean, that's, that is how, you know, Jesus, Jesus said, be perfect. They always quote this as be perfect. Like your father in heaven is perfect. But the word for perfect there is the word for reaching your end, reaching your purpose, fulfilling what you're here for. So what he's saying is that, that when you understand that it starts to make sense of all things, of the things like, you know, uh, um, turn the other cheek. What he's saying is you fulfill your purpose. Don't let other people get in the way of you doing that. Um, and, in fact, the word for sin in, in Greek is a word that means to miss the target. It doesn't mean to do something bad. It means to miss your end. And so that's what we're really arguing about. And when everybody is saying the same thing, you have to start to ask yourself questions. You, because every, every incident, a shooting, a school shooting, a vote, every incident can be covered from a million different angles. So if everybody is covering it from the same angle, you have to start to say, hey, there's an agenda here right? You might cover this, just tell the facts. That would be a good way to start. You might cover it from the mental illness point of view. You might cover it from gun, the gun point of view, whatever you want, you know, whatever you're doing, when everybody is covering it from the same point of view, you have to say, why? Why is it? It's because they don't really have a sense of what the gun issue is about. Yesterday, somebody wrote me in the mailbag and asked me about free will. And I was kind of riffing on it. I wasn't talking about it, but you know, th there's a guy, uh, 
Yuval Noah Harari, I think his name is, he wrote this really interesting book called Sapiens. And he's one of these guys who, like Sam Harris, just makes these absolute statements with absolute confidence that you can't possibly know whether they're true or not. So there's no free will. It was always an illusion. Illusion It's always an illusion. It's, you know, religion, religion is just, it's a fiction. Religion or just, just fiction. And you think like, well, wait a minute. This argument has been going on for thousands of years. And then, and then they always use the same trick. They always say, this may make some people uncomfortable. As if then you feel like, then you feel like you're the jerk, you know? <laughs> but the fact is, it makes you uncomfortable because it doesn't make any sense. The idea about free will that I was trying to get across is that really what we're arguing about when we're arguing is, are you there? Is there a you there? And this is the argument between scientism, which is not science. Scientism is the idea that science solves everything, and the idea of spirituality, the idea that the internal, the idea of spirituality is that the internal experience you are having is what is sacred about you. And that internal experience can be mistaken. You can be seen having delusions, but the very fact that you can be having delusions means that you can also be seeing things rightly. If you can be seeing them wrongly, that must be because there is a right that you're deviating from. What the scientists are always saying is though this you is an illusion thrown up by physical forces. And that doesn't make any sense to me because what it essentially says is there has to be a physical world in order for there to be an idea. It has to be that every, we know that there are ideas that are true. Two plus two equals four is a true idea. It has no physical body, but you can never experience without the physical body. You can't experience it without my saying it. I can't experience it without the, my brain sending signals to my mind. These ideas only can express themselves in physical form. What makes sense to me is that the physical world is an expression of an idea, and it's the idea of God, and that you, your body, your, your life is an expression of the idea of you, God's idea of you. That is what the spiritual world says. If that's true, then the important thing, the most important thing we have is you and your freedom, your ability to express the, who you are and live out God's idea of you to the fullest possible extent, which you can only do by having free choice. That means you're going to make mistakes. That means that some of you are going to do evil. That means that the world is going to be a much more chaotic and unequal place than it would be if I, if I can stop believing in you and start controlling you in a way that seems good to the powerful and the elite, right? That's the argument we're having. That is the argument we're having. What I say is I say that you, your internal experience of you is the most important thing about you. The other question I always get in the mailbag is if God is good and all powerful, why is there evil? Same thing. There's evil because there is freedom. There's evil because there's freedom because the most important thing to God is you. And this is, you know, this is the Western tradition that has come up to us through Plato, through Aristotle, through Jesus. All of these guys funneling into our lives, and people have been thinking about this forever. And the pe the same people who understood that evil was a result of freedom understood that you should be free. Why do we have guns? That's why. Why do they not want us to have guns? That's why. We want to have guns because we know that freedom means certain things. It means you can't have equality. If I'm free, I'm going to be, you're going to be a better basketball player than I am. I, I can't do that. Unless I stop you from being a good basketball player, you're going to be better than I am. If we have freedom, we can't have peace. We can't have peace all the time because people want to take away your freedom. They envy it. They hate it. They despise it. They want to take away your freedom for your own good. As we have watched over these past weeks, we have seen that th there is a large segment of this population in America that does not like freedom, that will sit there and say, oh, North Korea, isn't that wonderful? Isn't that North Korea lady at the Olympics? Isn't she, look how beautiful she is. She doesn't even use makeup and look how pretty she is. You know, and we say, well, yeah, but they kill people en masse. They yeah, but I mean, they're winning because Mike Pence is evil and believes in Jesus. You know, this is what we're arguing about. We know they don't like our freedom. We believe our freedom is sacred. We want guns because we know one day they might show up at our house and try to take our freedom away. They've been trying to take it away bit by bit for a long time. We want guns to defend our freedom. And we understand we're not fools. We understand, you know, this argument when people say we're more guns, less violence. I, I, don't, I don't know if that's true or not. I mean, I would like to have good people with guns and this. Uh, fight off bad guys with guns. But the point is, we know there's going to be more chaos. We know there's going to be more violence if we're free. We believe, as God seems to believe about us, that freedom is worth it. Freedom is worth all the bad things that happen. So the fact that these guys go on and cry on the air, I have sympathy with their tears. I cry too when I hear these stories. I, you know, they, they break my heart. But we are talking about something else. And if you want to have that debate, then we can start to build the new consensus that this country leads 
needs because our old consensus has clearly uh, disappeared.